A fleet of sleek, agile vessels skimming the surface of the sea, designed to tackle modern coastal threats with unmatched versatility. About 20 years ago, the littoral combat ship, LCS, promised to revolutionize naval warfare. These small, fast, and adaptable ships were meant to be the shining stars of the U.S. Navy, countering the diverse challenges of the 21st century. But something went wrong. Why did this ambitious program, once heralded as the renaissance of naval operations, become one of the most controversial projects in recent military history? From delays and skyrocketing costs to early retirements and fierce criticism, the LCS program has faced numerous hurdles. Are these ships a prime example of innovation gone astray, or are they still finding their footing in the modern naval landscape? Let's explore what really happened and where the future of these vessels might lead. By the late 1990s, the U.S. Navy recognized that its fleet of Cold War-era cruisers and destroyers, built for open ocean battles, were ill-suited for operations in coastal waters. These shallow zones presented unique threats such as high-speed boats, missile-firing fast attack craft, small submarines, sea mines, and anti-ship missiles launched from both land and air. A stark example of these dangers was the USS Cole bombing. On October 12, 2000, while the guided missile destroyer was refueling in the port of Aden, Yemen, it was attacked by Al-Qaeda. A small fiberglass boat packed with C-4 explosives and manned by two suicide bombers struck the ship, creating a massive 40 by 60 foot hole in its port side, killing 17 sailors and injuring 37 others. To address these emerging threats, the U.S. Navy sought a more innovative solution than simply upgrading corvettes. They needed vessels that could quickly adapt to various missions and support larger ships during extensive combat operations. Initially, the Navy focused on the DD-21 program, which aimed to create a large destroyer capable of both coastal and open ocean missions. Concurrently, strategists Wayne Hughes and Art Sabrowski proposed the Street Fighter concept. This idea centered on small, heavily armed, cost-effective ships that could be considered expendable if severely damaged. Despite the innovative thinking, neither the DD-21 nor the Street Fighter concepts were fully adopted. In 2001, when Donald Rumsfeld became Secretary of Defense, he pushed for transformational military strategies. Admiral Vernon Clark, the new Chief of Naval Operations, then proposed a new family of ships, including the Littoral Combat Ship. The goal was to produce more affordable and quickly built ships to expand the fleet. Clark championed the LCS as his most significant transformational project and prioritized its funding in 2003, allocating $15 billion to the program, even before detailed analysis and design work were completed. Just a quick moment before we unveil the rest. If you're new here, consider subscribing to this channel. Stay up to date and never miss out on the latest insights. And now, let's go on. The development of the LCS moved quickly, with prototypes being submitted in 2004 by Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics, alongside contributions from Raytheon. The Navy selected designs from Lockheed Martin and General Dynamics for further evaluation, leading to the construction of two vessels from each company for sea trials. Instead of choosing one design, the Navy decided to fund both, resulting in the creation of two variants, the Lockheed Martin Freedom Class, launched in 2006, and the General Dynamics, later taken over by Austal USA, Independence Class, launched in 2008. However, the construction process was plagued with problems, causing delays and significant cost overruns even before the first ships were completed. Initially, the Navy had hoped the LCS would be a cost-effective and flexible platform, targeting a price of around $220 million per ship. This estimate turned out to be overly optimistic, as it did not fully consider the complexities of developing a new class of ships with advanced modular capabilities. Both Lockheed Martin and Austal USA encountered higher-than-expected construction costs due to innovative designs and materials, as well as the steep learning curve of building these new classes. For instance, the cost of constructing the first Freedom Class ship, USS Freedom, soared to about $500 million, more than double the initial estimate. Technical issues compounded the financial challenges. Problems with propulsion systems, the integration of modular mission packages, and other technical hurdles required additional funding to address. These issues caused further delays and increased the overall cost of the program. 
Congress took notice of these financial challenges, closely scrutinizing the budget overruns and questioning the Navy's management and oversight of the program. Despite these challenges, the Navy remained optimistic about the LCS's potential. In response to the financial concerns, the Navy made several adjustments to the program. They realigned the budget multiple times to accommodate the rising costs, reallocating funds from other projects and seeking additional appropriations from Congress. To control further cost increases, the Navy implemented various measures such as renegotiating contracts, improving project management, and enhancing oversight of the contractors. Initially, the Navy planned to acquire 55 LCS vessels, but due to escalating costs and changing strategic priorities, this number was reduced to 35 ships. This reduction aimed to balance the need for capable littoral ships with the available budget. Now let's dive deeper into the characteristics of these ships. As said earlier, the littoral combat ship program features two distinct classes, the Freedom class and the Independence class. While there are several differences and similarities between them, both were designed to meet the same overall capabilities. The Freedom class measures about 378 feet in length and features a traditional monohull design. This approach to naval architecture makes the ship easier to maintain and familiar to operate. In contrast, the Independence class is 418 feet long and 46 feet wider, with a unique trimaran hull. This trimaran design provides greater stability and more deck space, which is particularly advantageous for helicopter operations. Both classes are constructed from advanced materials like aluminum and high-strength steel. These materials offer a balance of durability and lightweight properties, combined with modern construction techniques, resulting in robust yet agile vessels. Despite their design differences, the Freedom and Independence classes share key capabilities, especially speed and maneuverability in shallow seas. Both variants have drafts of less than 15 feet, allowing them to operate close to shore and pursue small boats at high speeds. Each class can reach speeds of over 40 knots, making them the fastest non-nuclear surface ships in the Navy. The high speeds are achieved through their propulsion systems, which feature combined diesel and gas turbine engines. Additionally, both classes use high-powered water jet propulsion systems instead of conventional propellers. This setup enhances their agility and enables them to operate in shallow waters where traditional propellers would be less effective. The Independence class, however, has an edge in fuel efficiency and range due to its design. It also features higher automation, which requires fewer crew members than the Freedom class. One of the standout features of the LCS is its modularity. The ships are designed with modular sections that can be quickly swapped out, allowing them to switch between different mission packages with ease. This flexibility means they can adapt to a wide range of missions, from surface warfare to mine countermeasures. The littoral combat ships are engineered with adaptable armament and sensor systems that can be tailored to suit different missions. At the heart of the LCS's weaponry is the Mark 110 57mm main gun, capable of firing in multiple modes such as air burst, point detonating, and armor piercing, making it highly effective against surface targets. Additionally, both the Freedom and Independence variants are equipped with a range of missiles designed to tackle aerial and surface threats. For close-range defense, the LCS is outfitted with secondary weapons, including machine guns and other smaller caliber arms. A key defensive feature is the CRAM system, which merges the Phalanx close-in weapon system with rolling airframe missiles, RAM. By replacing the traditional Phalanx gun with RAM missiles, the CRAM system offers extended range and enhanced defensive capabilities. The RAM is a fire-and-forget missile, using both radio frequency detection and infrared sensors to track and neutralize incoming threats. The Freedom variant specifically uses the Mark 49 launcher, with RIM-116 rolling airframe missiles for self-defense. Over time, both LCS variants have been equipped with various surface-to-surface -surface missiles, including a naval version of the Army's Hellfire missile. As of 2023, these are being replaced by the longer-range Naval Strike missile, which significantly boosts the ship's offensive capabilities. Both the Freedom and Independence variants can be equipped with the Surface Warfare Package, which includes 30mm gun systems, 11-meter rigid hull inflatable boats, surface-to-surface -surface missile modules, MH-60R helicopters armed with Hellfire missiles, and Fire Scout unmanned aerial vehicles. These helicopters provide additional capabilities for utility, surveillance, and light anti-submarine warfare, 
deploying the Mark 54 lightweight torpedo for underwater threats. In addition to its offensive armaments, the LCS features advanced defensive measures and countermeasures, such as decoy launchers and electronic warfare systems designed to protect the ship from incoming missiles and other threats. As mentioned earlier, one of the primary roles of the LCS is to tackle various mine warfare tasks, such as mine sweeping, remote detection, bypassing, and mine hunting. To achieve this, the LCS is equipped with a specialized mine countermeasure module that employs advanced techniques based on acoustic and magnetic signatures, moving beyond traditional contact or mechanical methods. Here's a brief overview of the key systems included in the mine countermeasure module. First up, the Airborne Laser Mine Detection System. Mounted on helicopters, this advanced laser technology quickly spots and classifies mines just below the water's surface. Next, we have the Airborne Mine Neutralization System. Also helicopter deployed, it identifies mines and neutralizes them by strategically placing explosives to ensure safe destruction. Switching to remote capabilities, there's the Remote Mine Hunting System, an unmanned remotely operated vehicle, scours beneath the waves, sending back real-time data to the ship on detected underwater mines. The Unmanned Influence Sweep System takes a proactive approach by mimicking the acoustic and magnetic signatures of a ship to trigger mines from a safe distance, effectively clearing the path ahead. Lastly, there's the Knifefish Unmanned Underwater Vehicle. This device is specifically engineered to find and classify mines hidden in cluttered seabeds or buried under sand, ensuring comprehensive mine detection and classification. The littoral combat ships were also initially equipped to hunt and destroy submarines using an advanced suite of integrated sonar devices, helicopters, and torpedoes. The Anti-Submarine Warfare ASW module was designed to enhance the LCS's ability to detect, track, and neutralize submarine threats. However, the ASW systems faced significant integration issues that hampered their effectiveness. The towed sonar, a critical component for detecting submarines at range, struggled to function properly within the vessel's turbulent wake, reducing its detection capability. Additionally, the Freedom-class ships were found to generate excessive noise, making it difficult to track stealthy submarines without being detected themselves. These technical challenges were compounded by difficulties in integrating the ASW module with other ship systems, leading to unreliable performance and frequent maintenance issues. Due to these persistent issues and the high costs associated with addressing them, the Navy decided to cancel the Anti-Submarine Warfare Module in 2022. The LCS have been deployed in various regions around the world, undertaking a wide range of missions. Key deployments include operations in the South China Sea, the Persian Gulf, and anti-piracy missions off the coast of Africa. In the South China Sea, LCS vessels have played a crucial role in freedom of navigation operations, showcasing their ability to operate in contested waters. In the Persian Gulf, LCS ships have conducted mine countermeasure missions, leveraging their modular design to switch between different mission packages as needed. During anti-piracy missions off the coast of Africa, the LCS has demonstrated its speed and agility, effectively patrolling large areas and responding quickly to emerging threats. The LCS program has achieved several notable successes. The modular design has proven valuable in allowing rapid reconfiguration of the ships for different missions, enhancing their operational flexibility. Also, the high speed and shallow draft of the LCS have enabled effective operations in littoral environments where larger ships would struggle. Despite these successes, the LCS program has faced significant challenges. Technical issues with the modular mission packages have resulted in reliability concerns and increased maintenance requirements. The concept required sophisticated interfaces and connectors to allow for rapid changes in equipment, which proved to be more complex than initially anticipated. Problems with the electrical, mechanical, and software integration of these modules led to delays and increased costs. The reliability of the mission modules has also been a concern. Early tests and deployments revealed that the modules were not as robust as required, leading to frequent maintenance and repairs. This undermined the intended flexibility of the ships as time-consuming maintenance reduced their availability for missions. Operationally, the modular design has not delivered the expected level of flexibility. Swapping out mission modules requires the ship to return to port, which can be a time-consuming process. This limits the ship's ability to rapidly adapt to changing mission requirements while deployed. Furthermore, the storage and handling of the modules present logistical challenges, 
as each module needs to be maintained and transported securely. Performance issues have also plagued the modular design. Some mission packages did not perform as expected in real-world conditions. For instance, the Mine Countermeasures module faced difficulties in detecting and neutralizing mines effectively. The ships themselves faced significant mechanical issues. In 2013, the USS Freedom broke down multiple times en route to Singapore and during its deployment. Other Freedom-class vessels also experienced major breakdowns shortly after their launch, often requiring towing back to port. In 2020, an investigation identified a weak combining gear in the Freedom class's transmission as the root cause of many mechanical problems. This gear, which linked the power output of the ship's multiple engines to achieve high speeds, was not robust enough. Consequently, the Navy temporarily halted the delivery of new Freedom class ships until the issue was resolved. To keep existing ships operational, their speed was restricted to 18 knots, severely limiting their effectiveness. The Independence class was not without its defects. In 2019, cracks were discovered in the USS Omaha at the joint between the superstructure and the hull. Initially, these cracks were deemed minor, but similar issues appeared in other Independence class ships, revealing a manufacturing defect. Ships with these cracks were restricted to speeds below 15 knots and could not operate in sea states above level 4. Due to persistent technical issues and high operational costs, the U.S. Navy has announced plans to retire several LCS earlier than their expected service lives. Specifically, the Navy intends to decommission nine Freedom-class ships that have faced significant problems with their combining gears. In addition, the Navy plans to retire two Independence-class ships. Although these ships are less problematic than their Freedom-class counterparts, they still present significant maintenance and operational challenges. The decision to retire these LCS ships is driven by strategic and budgetary considerations. The Navy aims to optimize its fleet by focusing on vessels that offer better performance and reliability. This move has sparked debate in Congress. Some lawmakers argue that the LCS can still play valuable roles in lower threat environments, such as drug interdiction and maritime security operations. Despite these setbacks, Ongoing efforts to refine and improve the mission modules continue, with the goal of fully realizing the potential flexibility and versatility envisioned for the literal combat ship program. Recent upgrades include improved maintenance practices, with a shift from reliance on contractors to training crews to handle maintenance themselves. The program has also seen advancements in lethality and versatility. The installation of the Naval Strike Missile on Independence-class ships has enhanced their combat capabilities, and the successful deployment of unmanned aerial systems like Textron Systems Aerosonde demonstrates the LCS's potential in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions. The Navy continues to express confidence in the LCS's relevance, highlighting its role in freeing up larger, more expensive warships for high-tier missions. Despite the challenges, the LCS is seen as a valuable asset for operations in littoral zones and supporting larger fleet operations. The recent improvements and ongoing upgrades suggest that the LCS program is turning a corner, with hopes that it will fulfill its intended role more effectively in the future.